Hi everybody, welcome back to another lecture about Gauss's Law in Electricity and Magnetism. In the last videos we discussed situations first involving spherical symmetry and then involving planar symmetry. In this discussion we're going to address problems involving cylindrical symmetry where you're dealing with something that is analogous to an infinitely long cylinder in which the charge density does not vary at any length along the cylinder but it might vary with respect to distance from the center of the cylinder as we'll see in some of our examples. So the line might have thickness or it might actually just be a line. Now keep in mind again that Gauss's law cannot be used if there is any sort of angular dependence or if there is any sort of z dependence if we say have our cylinder concentric with the z axis. It only works if the charge density is independent of the position along the cylinder and independent of angle but it still works if it's not independent of distance from the center of the cylinder. So let's first tackle, as we've done before with our previous discussions, a trivial example, something that we already know about. Let's use Gauss's law to calculate the electric field at a distance s from the axis of an infinitely long straight line of charge with charge per unit length lambda. So in some ways this is kind of like a slab problem where our Gaussian cylinder will or our Gaussian surface will have an arbitrary length as opposed to an arbitrary area, but it will not, of course, be able to cover the infinite length of the line. So it must be cylindrical in shape so that it will be centered on the line so that we'll be able to exploit the symmetry properties involved with Gauss's law that make it so useful. So it's kind of a combination of concepts from spherical symmetry and planar symmetry, which is why I kept these examples for last. So here is our imaginary. I always try to remind you that this is an imaginary surface, but the mathematical laws still apply. So an imaginary Gaussian surface, it's a cylinder of length L and radius S. So obviously the actual value of the electric field at a distance S from the line should not be dependent on the length of our imaginary Gaussian surface. So that length L had better go away or not appear at all. Well, we'll see what happens. So Here's our general picture. So since this line charge has charge per unit length lambda, the amount of charge contained within our cylinder is simply equal to lambda times L. Now in employing our Gauss's law to find the electric flux, you know that by symmetry, because of the fact that this has symmetry along the axis, the electric field must be pointed radially outward in all directions from the line charge, which means that it goes through all parts of the main part of our cylinder, but not through the ends. It's tangent to the ends. So the end, end caps do not give us a contribution to our flux. So again, here's our Gauss's law. The left side will be trivial. The right side is where the fun usually is. So the left side, again, the electric flux does not the end caps do not give any contribution to the electric flux. The only thing that does is the actual cylindrical surface itself. What's the area of that? Well, the circumference of that is 2 pi s because we said that it had a radius of s. The length of it is l, so the area is 2 pi s l. And since the electric field is constant along that area, we're just able to pull everything out of the integral. So we just have e times a, where a is 2 pi s l. As we mentioned when referring to the picture in the last diagram, the enclosed charge is lambda times L. So yeah, we get L's showing up and the L's cancel because again, it, they'd better cancel because the electric field had better not depend on what sort of imaginary surface we imagine. So overall, we get that E is equal to 2K lambda over S. This agrees with the result that we got through a lot more mathematics of hard integration back in the previous chapter. So, and again, since we're asked for the electric field, um, this turns into an electric field vector where I just have this unit vector pointing directly outward from the center of, or at least from our line. Now, sometimes we need to do this, sometimes not. I'm actually not always consistent in 
bringing back forth the vector field nature on a test or on an AP exam, they'll be clear what you're supposed to do. Now, keep in mind that it's not always going to be this easy, though the left side of Gauss's law always will be. Remember, with spherical symmetry, the left side is always 4 pi r squared e. For planar symmetry, it's always e a. For cylindrical symmetry, like what we just had, it's always 2 pi s l e, where again, the l's are going to cancel, and the e is what we're usually going to be solving for. So, in this case, we got lucky because there was it was only the charge on a line, so the enclosed charge, that being lambda L, was trivial. So, usually for these types of problems, you're not going to be given lambda. Instead, you're going to be given a volume charge density, or sometimes even a surface charge density uh, for, say, like a cylindrical shell. And if it's a surface charge density, you're just going to have to realize, okay, if I have um, a charge an imaginary Gaussian cylinder of length L, then the total amount of charge there is going to be equal to the area of what's enclosed, which is going to be 2 pi S L times the area, the area charge density, the eta. So in any case, dealing with volume charge densities, we'll end up getting there soon. Next, let's consider the uh, another almost trivial example, but not as trivial as the previous one. Consider an infinitely long cylindrical conductor. Remember, with a conductor, all the charges on the surface. And here it has radius big R and charge per unit length lambda. And again, they could have given it to us in terms of eta or something like that, but the general process would still be the same. Well, guess what? We've already done this problem. Since all the charges on the surface, any Gaussian cylinder inside of the surface would include no charge. However, outside, you'd get lambda L, just like in the previous example. The only difference here is that now we have two answers depending on what the value of S is. If S is less than R, less than big R, then the electric field is going to be zero. If it's greater than or equal to big R, the electric field is 2k lambda over S. Okay, how about putting it in terms of charge per unit area eta. So calculate the electric field at a distance s from the center of this conductor. It's the same problem as before, just they expressed the givens using different language. Obviously, the electric field inside, again, is zero. And outside, a Gaussian surface of length L and radius s would contain an amount of charge equal to eta times the area, but the area is 2 pi R L, where that, that would be the area of the actual cylinder. Um, notice again the cylinder has radius big R, but the flux therefore would be 2 pi S L E, in other words area of the imaginary Gaussian cylinder times the electric field, whatever that happens to be. That's what we're solving for after all. We set those equal to each other. So the flux is equal to enclosed charge over epsilon naught. That's called Gauss's law. And the two pi's cancel, the L's cancel, and what we're left with is that the electric field at some distance S outside of our cylinder is equal to E to R over epsilon naught S. So if S is less than R, E is zero. If S is greater than or equal to R, it's equal to E to R over epsilon naught S. So were the answers really different? So again, you could have turned the linear charge density into a true surface charge density, but that would have given you an extra factor of 2 pi r in the denominator, and that's what accounts for the appearance, the difference in how our answers actually looked. Next, let's turn our attention to a constant density cylinder of radius big R and constant charge density rho. And as you can probably imagine, if you've been following the pattern of our previous sets of videos, um, the next example is going to be a situation where the density is not constant. And again, whenever they use the term long, what they mean is infinitely long. 
that's true in AP Physics C, Electricity and Magnetism. That's going to be true in your 200 level engineering class in college. That's going to be true in your 300 level electromagnetism class in college. So whenever they say long, what they really mean is effectively infinitely long. So again, we write down Gauss's law and we have the amount of flux on the left side is so we have not written down Gauss's law yet we've simply simply written down the definition of flux but again that's just area times e the area of our imaginary Gaussian cylinder of length L and radius R is 2 pi R L and the electric field strength there is e of course that's what we're trying to solve for but just writing that down as part of our givens helps well here we have Gauss's law now it says that that flux is the enclosed charge over epsilon naught. More precisely, that the integral of e vector dot dA vector is enclosed charge over epsilon naught, but that's just flux. And we just worked that out as 2 pi R L E. But what about the enclosed charge? Let's say right now we're dealing with a Gaussian cylinder of radius little r less than big R. In that case, the enclosed charge inside of our Gaussian cylinder is going to be equal to, well, the sum of all of the little bitty charges. How do we make that sum? Well, it's going to be the sum from all of the little cylindrical shells of radius going from 0 out to little r of the charge density times the volume of each of those little shells. Well, the volume of each little shell is equal to the length of each little shell times the area of that little shell. And that area is just going to be um, 2 pi r prime times dr prime. And again, there's our density, which since the density is constant, I took away the um, radius contribution. How does this actually look? Let's get a visual idea of how this looks. If you were to look directly down the axis of your cylinder of radius big R, um, so in light gray, we have the outer extent of our actual cylinder, our real cylinder of radius big R. Well, I've also drawn in darker gray an imaginary Gaussian cylinder of radius little r less than big R. And it has some finite length into the screen of length capital L. Now, notice that in order to figure out the total charge that is added up here, what we need to do is add up the contributions of a bunch of these um, little turquoise shells that each have thickness dr prime. So each shell has a radius of r prime and a thickness of dr prime. So the amount of charge that is contained in that shell is going to be equal to the volume of this shell times the charge density at radius little r prime. Well, the volume of such a shell is equal to its length times its infinitesimal area. Well, the area, as we mentioned, is just the circumference times its thickness. So the circumference times the thickness is the area of such a shell looking down it. And then the volume of the shell is going to be the area times the length, again, which is directed into the slide or into the screen. So the area is 2 pi r prime dr prime. The length is L. So the volume of each one of these shells is 2 pi r prime L times dr prime. Again, r prime is what's going to change. We're going to add together all of the contributions of shells ranging from r prime equals 0 all the way out to r prime equals r, little r that is, in order to figure out the total charge that is contained in our imaginary Gaussian cylinder of radius little r. And that will be used to allow us to figure out the electric field at a position of r from the center of our real cylinder of constant charge density. So here's where we're at so far. Gauss's law is on the left, but we already evaluated that flux as 2 pi little r times L times E, where 2 pi little r times L is the area. And the enclosed charge, again, is equal to the sum of all the little bitty charges, the sum of all the dQs, but the dQs are equal to the volume charge density times the actual little bitty volumes. And again, the little bitty volumes are the lengths of the cylinders times 
the little bitty areas. But the little bitty areas, as we mentioned, for a cylinder of radius r prime and thickness dr prime is going to be equal to 2 pi r prime l times dr prime. There's our little bitty, or sorry, not little bitty, uh, well, the whole thing is our little bitty volume. Um, you could think of this as another expression of a little bitty area just um, an area going down an axis instead of an area of um, a circle of thickness dr prime. Either way is fine. You get the same result. In fact, the, 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 the equivalence of those is actually something that, if you're in multivariable calculus, uh, ends up leading to the realization of the equivalence of the order of integration for iter iterated integrals. Anyway, we don't need to concern ourselves with that here. Hopefully this is understandable up to this point, that our little bitty volume for our shell of radius r prime and length l and thickness dr prime is going to be 2 pi r prime l times dr prime. How you want to think of that volume is up to you, but either way it's 2 pi r prime l dr prime. Now, what about that density rho? The density is a constant, so it pops out of the integral. So does the 2 pi, so does the L. Those things are constants, so they all pop out of the integrals. The only thing that's left inside of the integral is the integral of r prime dr prime. Well, that's easy. That's kindergarten calculus. That's r prime squared over 2. And remember, we're adding up all the contributions of shells of thickness dr prime, ranging from a radius of r prime equals 0 all the way out to r prime equals little r. So when you do that and evaluate that, you get just an r squared over 2. Um, plugging in the 0 just gives you a 0 contribution. The 2's cancel, so you're left with pi rho l r squared for the enclosed charge for your Gaussian cylinder of length l and radius r. So I sure hope that length l goes away when we end up making this and putting everything together. So the enclosed charge is pi rho l r squared. So that means that according to Gauss's law, the flux is equal to that enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught. Well, we calculated the flux. It's 2 pi r l e. Oh, there's another factor of l. That's nice. So 2 pi r l e must equal pi rho l r squared over epsilon naught. Yay, the l's cancel, just like they should. The pi's also cancel. So there we go. For anything inside of our real cylinder, of uniform density, the electric field is rho r over 2 epsilon naught. What about outside? Well, outside the enclosed charge is going to be equal to what the enclosed charge is at a radius of little r equals big R. So just plug in a big R up in here for our expression for enclosed charge. You get pi rho l big R squared, that is the radius of the actual cylinder. So that means that the flux is equal to that pi rho l big R squared over epsilon naught. Well, what's the flux? Well, the flux is the same thing it was before. It's a different value of r than before. This time r is bigger, little r is bigger than big R. So I kind of made that notation right here, but I didn't really need to. So what do we have now? Well, the pi's cancel, the l's cancel, but that's it. Um, the r's don't cancel because r is actually, in other words, we, we should expect that the radius of our cylinder would have something to do with the electric field strength, because after all, the bigger the cylinder, the more total charge you have if you have a constant charge density. So here we have our expression for the electric field outside of the cylinder, after dividing both sides by two, well, canceling the pi's and l's, and dividing both sides by two little r, you get the, the electric field, at little r greater than big R is equal to rho big R squared over 2 epsilon naught little r. And notice, if you plug in little r equals big R, after all this was a continuous charge distribution, so the electric field had better um, be the same in either expression at the surface. Plug in little r equals big R in the top and bottom expression. The top expression is rho big R over 2 epsilon naught. The bottom expression becomes rho big R squared over 2 epsilon naught r. And you can cancel those because, after all, big R is not equal to zero. It's a cylinder. It's not a line. And it works out at the surface, as you would expect for a continuous charge distribution. So 
Hopefully that was understandable. We have had a situation where we had a constant charge density, so we needed to figure out the electric field inside of the cylinder by adding up the contributions to it from a bunch of little shells inside of our imaginary Gaussian surface that we also had painted inside of the cylinder. One more example. Calculate the electric field at all points little r from the center of a solid tube of radius big R that is charged in such a way that rho of r equals rho naught times 1 minus little r over big R, where rho naught is a constant. Well, rho naught is a constant. They could have called it anything. They could have called it A, alpha. They better not call it eta. That would be really confusing. Um, but rho is not a constant, so it's not going to pop out at the integral. Rho naught will. What is rho naught? Well, it's a constant. They, if they really want us to go too much further at the end, they better tell us the value of the constant. If they don't tell us the value, then we're just going to leave it as rho naught. Point is, since we're not told anything about a total charge or a charge per unit length or anything like that, then we don't need to solve for rho naught. If they did tell us that the charge per unit length was a certain number of newtons per, uh, or sorry, coulombs per meter, then we would need to solve for rho naught using a similar normalization procedure as what we've used before. A problem like that has occasionally shown its reared its head on the AP exam. But I think we have enough examples now that um, you, you'll be able to deal with that. In any case, so here, first consider the situation outside of our tube. So Gaussian cylinder of length little big R, or sorry, of length L and radius little r, where little r in this case is greater than big R. So we'll solve, this time we'll solve outside of the tube first. So first of all, when the Gaussian cylinder is being used inside the tube, the enclosed charge is dependent on the radius of the cylinder. That's what we're going to tackle later. But outside of the tube, it's just the same as what it is at little r equals big R. So the electric field, though, will still change because the surface area of your tube is changing as you um, get, or uh, of your Gaussian cylinder is changing as you get out farther and farther away from the tube. Okay, so keep in mind that generally speaking in solving these types of problems you need to come up with a plan. Something similar to what we had in the last example, but this one's going to be harder because it's not a constant charge distribution. It's again a continuous charge distribution, but it's not continuously constant like it was in the last example. So if you're likely to get confused, it's a good idea to write down your plan. Uh, at least when you're practicing. During the AP exam or during a final exam, you're not going to have time for that, which is why it's important to practice a lot of these types of problems on your own. Better yet, after this example, pause the video and try to recreate the solution on your own. So, in this case, our plan is going to be as follows. We're going to determine how much charge is contained within some length, capital L, of our tube. We're going to use that result to determine the electric field for little r greater than big R outside of the tube. And then we'll determine how much charge is contained within that same length in a Gaussian cylinder of radius little r less than or equal to big R inside of the tube. And use that result to figure out the electric field at said radii. So first, outside of the pipe, or outside of the tube. So figure out how much charge is inside of the cylinder well, for of length L um, in, inside of little r greater than big R. Well, that's going to be the amount of charge that is inside the tube up to radius big R. So what we need to do is we need to integrate our volume charge density out to a radius of big R. So similar to what we were doing before, we're going to have a bunch of cylindrical shells. In this case, it's okay to call their uh, radii little r and thickness dr because of the fact that we're going out to a radial position of big R as opposed to little r. When we're going out to little r inside of the tube um, in, to get the electric field inside of the tube, we're going to have to rename our coordinates just like we did before. But in this case, consider a particular cylinder of thickness d little r 
that will have a volume dv equal to the area of such a cylinder times its thickness. So the area is 2 pi rl, its thickness is dr. Or you could think of the area of the circle, or the, the area of the ring as 2 pi r dr, and then the length, of, then multiply by the length to make it a cylinder of l. Either way, you get a volume. And we're going to integrate all these cylinders of, thick, of radius r and thickness dr from little r equals 0 to little r equals big R. And then we'll do something similar inside the pipe later. And I'll show you a picture of this soon, but the picture is more instructive when you're actually going out to the Gaussian cylinder of radius little r less than big R. If you need the picture right now, then just pause the video and go back to where we had the picture in the previous problem because it's actually the same picture. Okay, except in this case we're going all the way out to little r equals big R. So there's our volume element. We're integrating all this from little r equals zero to big R. So there's our expression for that. The total charge enclosed is equal to the sum of all the little bitty charges, the sum of all the dqs, but dq is rho dv this time rho does not pop out of the integral. Constants do, like rho naught and 2 pi and L, so they pop out. But everything else stays in. We need to distribute through this little r that's still left over here. So that's why the 1 didn't come out, or why we... Um, so in any case, the little r distributes through, and we get a little r times little r squared over big R. And that integral is, again, a polynomial. Integral of little r is little r squared over 2. Integral of little r squared over big R is little r cubed over 3 big R. We're evaluating that from 0 to big R. The 0 is going to give a 0 contribution because it's a polynomial. The big R, however, will not. There's the big R, so a half minus a third is a sixth. So we're left with big R squared over 6 inside of the parentheses. 2 over 6 is called 1 over 3. So overall, we're left with the enclosed charge being pi L rho naught R squared over 3, where that R is a big R. So that's the enclosed charge for any Gaussian cylinder of radius L outside of our particular pipe that has this um, charge distribution of um, such that it's rho of R equals rho naught times 1 minus a little R over big R. Okay. So now we can use Gauss's law to evaluate the electric field at any distance r from the center of our pipe outside of the pipe. So there we go. The right side of this is just equal to that enclosed charge that we found divided by epsilon naught. Don't forget to divide by epsilon naught. The left side is the electric field times the area of our imaginary Gaussian cylinder. Remember, it's the imaginary Gaussian cylinder, and that's always going to have a radius of little r. So the area is 2 pi little r times l. So again, it's an area we're looking for, not a volume. But it's a little r here, so that's where you get your distance dependence. So pi's cancel, that's nice. Nothing else really cancels, except the l's, of course. They'd better cancel. So you're left with the electric field being rho naught big R squared over 6 epsilon naught R, where that's a little r. So there's your distance dependence. And as expected, the electric field goes as 1 over distance, just like it does for a line charge. That should not be surprising. It's just that this time the proportionality constant is different because there's a different amount of charge contained, or at least it's expressed differently. Okay. So now, what about inside of the cylinder? Well, the left side of the Gauss's law is still the same, 2 pi r l e. Of course, the value of r is different. It's less than big R now. The right side, though, is where the fun begins. So again, this is where I'm going to show you the picture. To figure out what the right side is, we're keeping the same integral, but we're in integrating out to a point, or at least out to uh, our radius of our imaginary Gaussian cylinder of radius little r, because that's as far as you can go if you're inside of the cylinder. So we're integrating out to little r. 
So since that little r, that's, we don't want to use uh, radio coordinate, the same as a specific point, um, we're going to rename our radio coordinates to little r prime. So here's the same picture we had before. It's the same idea. We're going to add together to figure out the enclosed charge inside of our imaginary Gaussian cylinder of radius little r. We're going to add together a bunch of shells of thickness d little r prime all the way from little r prime equals zero out to little r prime equals little r. So this is just an example of such a shell, but we need to add, add together all of the shells going from zero to little r. And again, each shell has a volume equal to its length times the um, area of the ring, so to speak, or you could think of it as the area of a cylinder times the thickness of the cylinder, the area of the cylinder being uh, 2 pi r l, the thickness being dr, um, or 2 pi r prime l, the thickness being dr prime, or if you're thinking of it as the area of the ring, that would be 2 pi r prime dr prime, and then I'll, to make it a volume, multiply it by the height, so to speak, which is l. Either way, you get 2 pi r prime l dr prime for your volume element. <clears throat> so, Inside the cylinder, as we said, Gauss's law tells us that, well, Gauss's law, the left side of Gauss's law is 2 pi r l e, but the right side is where we have our integral expression. In the last problem, this was just a row naught, or a row, and the row just came out, and that was easy. This time it doesn't. Now notice though, the integral here for the enclosed charge is the same as it was when we were trying to figure out the total enclosed charge for figuring out the electric field outside of the cylinder. It's just that the integration bounds are different. The integrand is still the same. The 2 pi L rho naught comes out again. We're still left with, left with the same thing inside of the integral. So. This time again, we're just, about, instead of evaluating all the way out to big R, we're only evaluating out to little r less than big R. So when you do that, you end up getting little r squareds and little r cubes instead of big R squareds and big R cubes and all kinds of nice fun cancellations. This time, the things don't cancel. Instead, you just have to be satisfied with this expression for your enclosed charge being 2 pi L rho naught times little r squared over 2 minus little r cubed over 3 big R. And that is what you're going to set equal to the left side of Gauss's law, which hopefully you remember is 2 pi R L E. The L's cancel, the pi's cancel, the 2's cancel. And actually, some of the little r's cancel as well. You have a factor of little r over here, and in each expression, each term in this expression over here, you have at least a factor of little r as well, so some of those cancel as well, leaving you with, and the L's of course cancel, they'd better cancel, leaving you with your electric field of rho naught over epsilon naught times little r over 2 minus little r squared over 3 big R. So, let's summarize these results that we've just obtained. Overall, we have that the electric field is rho naught big R squared over 6 epsilon naught R, if, and that being a little r, if little r is greater than or equal to big R. We have that the electric field is rho naught over epsilon naught times little r over 2 minus little r squared over 3 big R, if little r is less than or equal to big R. And Notice that since it's a continuous charge distribution, as opposed to a shell of charge or something like that, the results match at the surface of the cylinder. If you plug in little r equals big R into this left-hand expression, you get a rho big R over 6 epsilon naught. If you do that with the right expression, the thing in parentheses is big R over 2 minus big R over 3, which is big R over 6, and again you get rho naught big R over 6 epsilon naught. So it works out. So again, even though the charge density is not continuous, in other words, the charge density goes out from the center and then uh, disappears at the edge, uh, the amount of charge contained in a Gaussian cylinder is continuous as the Gaussian cylinder's radius increases. So the electric field is going to be continuous. Now, 
Keep in mind that even though we used a finite length L to perform our Gauss's law calculation, this is something that allows us to get the flux each time. When we equate our results with the loop integral of E vector dot dA vector, the closed integral that is, surface integral, and the enclosed charge of epsilon naught, each of these has a factor of L, so these cancel. So it doesn't matter whether L is short or long or infinitely long, or letting it approach infinity. And also, even though we only used the Gaussian cylinder for a finite length of an infinite cylindrically symmetric charge distribution, the rest of the charge distribution does contribute to the electric field. It's just that because of those contributions, the symmetry makes it such that the only contributions to the electric field are radial contributions in the end. In other words, yeah, you have non-radial contributions from certain points, but those get canceled by non identical non-radial contributions in the opposite direction from other points along the line. If that wasn't true, you wouldn't be able to use Gauss's law because you wouldn't be able to have the electric field always having the same direction as the unit normal vector um, for the symmetry invoked in solving the problem. And such a situation would also be similar if you went um, for, say, like a finite plane of charge instead of an infinite plane of charge. So in other words, Gauss's law with cylinders only works if the cylinder is effectively infinitely long. Or, if it's a finite cylinder, if you are measuring your electric field at a sufficiently close distance, that the distance is much less than the length of your cylinder. Next, we will turn our attention to a discussion of conductors in electrostatic equilibrium, and that will be the subject of our next video. So, I will see you all then. Comments and questions on YouTube. Thank you all for watching.